In la que tú eres mi otro yo. Si te hago daño a ti, me hago daño a mí mismo. Si te amo y respeto, me amo y respeto yo. You are my other me. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. Dr. Sadna was an undergraduate here at UC Berkeley, uh, part of a generation that no doubt will be researched very soon for their uh, amazing creative activities while they were on this campus. One of the early things that I know came out of um, the cultural ferment among students of color, including Chicanx and other Latinx, um, were uh, journals, I mean, uh, student journals and magazines, but also uh, the historic Chicano Secret Service, which was formed by um, UC Berkeley students and, and nearby students, uh, like Dr. Tomas Carrasco, uh, the famous uh, writer and illustrator Lalo Alcaraz, were the three founding members. It's, a, it's an amazing satirical performance art group if you haven't seen them yet. Um, Dr. Sedna received a master of a PhD in English and rhetoric from UC Riverside. Um, I happened to read that dissertation. It was fascinating. Oh. He theorized Plato rhetorics. Plato <laughs> rhetorics, I just love it, right? This is like so signature. Composing a Chicano rhetoric, rhetorical tradition, Plato rhetorics, and the decolonial repurposing of technologies of self-determination. So PhD from uh, University of California, Riverside. Master of Fine Arts in Film and Television Directing and Production from UCLA. Um, and, um, and his range in teaching is really extensive. Uh, he has taught courses on um, uh, labor and film, uh, Latino literature, of course, um, movements in Latin America, ethnic images in cinema, critical issues in Chicano studies, uh, comparative ethnic and global uh, societies, Mexican and Latino identities. I mean, just really a beautiful, fascinating uh, palette of courses uh, that he has taught. He's published and presented um, extensively. Um, he was a moderator of a panel that, you know, I just have to name these because I just think the titles are so cool. A Chicano A Arroba, Chicano Time 2021, Tenochtitlan, The Jewel of Anahuac, a Zoom book talk. Um, Chicana uh, Arroba again, Time 21, Cultivating Quincentennial Consciousness. Um, enacting Change, Agitprop Theater from the Chicano and Farm Worker Movements to Now. Um, uh, why Mexicans are Left Out of Santa Monica's Race Debate. The PLM, the PLM and Regeneración Newspaper in Los Angeles. Uh, radical Plans, Polemics, and Traditions of the PLM. Um, Latinos Assimilation and Acculturation. Um, and just numerous, uh, you know, uh, numerous presentations and publications. Here's another one, Pleito y Aristotel, uh, TOTL, um, Chicano Literature in the Composition Classroom. He has also been a central uh, organizer in the Ethnic Studies Curriculum Movement, um, and he has also, which is part of what he's going to tell us about, he's been a central figure in um, a, a co-organizer artist in resisting the anti-Chicano and anti-ethnic studies uh, bans that we've seen in Arizona and that are still like um, uh, sweeping right the nation. Recently, Florida is another place where we're seeing this. Um, so this Chicano, again, arroba, a with a little tail pop-up book movement, he's co-founder of that movement. And when uh, he told me about this, among the numerous things he does, including making video and film, uh, I really, I really thought it was uh, incredibly pressing and important for us to hear from um, from Elias. Um, Elias is going to be in conversation with our own professor Kathy Rios, who is uh, a professor in the School of Education, and they have some history together in Arizona, working together on these types of projects. So, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Kathy de los Rios. I'm an associate professor of adolescent literacy and. Uh, multilingual education in the School of Education here on campus. Um, I'm a former uh, Chicanx Studies high school teacher, um, and I have known and been in the same orbit as Eddie Jazz for, I want to say, maybe two decades now. I remember being an undergrad, seeing him perform 
um, with the satirical mm -hmm. art group, um, Tibetan Secret Service. Um, and then kind of crossing paths with him again um, in 2007, 2008, when I was a high school teacher in Southern California, um, organizing alongside uh, families to start um, the first uh, Chicanx Latinx studies program in the Pomona Unified, Pomona Unified School District. And it was Elias who kind of um, was really um, so generous and um, really embodied the spirit and praxis of uh, Chicanx studies. Um, pulled me into uh, this larger group that he uh, founded and organized, um, Madrasa Studies Now, and was like, you gotta talk, you gotta talk on this panel. We need mujeres on this panel. Talk about your community work. And, um, and so I remember being really nervous and that being, as a teacher, one of the first kind of spaces that I spoke um, in public. And then we really reconnected in 2012 during um, the Mexican American Studies trial, Tucson Freedom Summer, we were both out there um, that summer canvassing, um, door knocking, we were volunteering, um, we were organizing, we were protesting. Um, he was doing a lot of this pop-up work while I was doing um, different women's self-defense workshops for the, the teachers and women in Tucson. Um, and at every single community event since, I have seen Elias. And what I especially appreciate about him um, within these kind of larger social movements for change, whether it be for ethnic studies or other kind of um, critical community topics, there is a type of um, machismo or chauvinistic kind of leadership styles that kind of um, emerge, right? And I, I really appreciate how Elias has always been very aware and willing to check in, right? <coughs> willing to be that kind of ally, um, at least for me. And so I have a lot of respect for Elias, a lot of love. Um, and again, when I think about um, the spirit and the praxis of Chicana, Chicano, and Chicanx studies, Elias really embodies those things, um, solidarity, critical community engagement, and re relationality. So I'm excited to um, learn from you and, and um, chat a little bit more. Elias, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, what, what an honor to be here and to see uh, old friends and new faces and the students. Lara, my ears, and Kati, my ears are glowing. I'm just like, uh, everyone always puts me down. <laughs> um, I got some jokes too, and stories. So uh, I, I, I wanted, you know, at first I was like, man, I got, I got to go back to Berkeley. I better sound smart. I got to put together a, a good ass theoretical Foucauldian, you know. Uh, you know, PowerPoint, and I said, I, I can't, I'm just so overwhelmed with life right now, um, and work, and, and a little bit of the arts. You know, I'm, I'm really um, uh, happy this happened because I got to use my hands and make some things. And, which reminds me, there's little pop-ups back there at that table. And so, you know, after the talk or at any time, you can go back, get bored, go, go out there, get a pop-up, careful, you don't get poked in the eye. <laughs> with these things, uh, uh, they come off the page. But uh, two, two things I want to point out. We, we have three manifestos. The, the very first one, which is a little color one. Alberto, can you hold one up? The, your, your copy, that one. That, that's the first one. It it's, uh, sits alongside the communist manifesto on most uh, shelves of communists. And uh, that's our first, there it is, the little eagle pops out. So we said our manifesto, something has to pop out. And then last night I made a few of these. These have been out of print for a while. And this is for the Quincentennial. It's the pop-up boo. They found this in a cave uh, in uh, Zacatecas or San Luis Potosí. And there's a pyramid on there. I, I, I would ask my students, how long did it take for the Aztecs to build a pyramid? And take a guess, how long? Lily, you, you, you're the big research person. Here. A hundred. Yeah, you know, I thought so too sometimes. Any other, some more guesses? 20. 20, good. How about some quicker ones, any guesses? A week. A week? That's so funny. You know, there's rumors that some, like the Templo Mayor, or one of the ones inside, uh, a month that they could do them in month, which I think that's crazy. That's some <laughs> enslaved labor. So. If they were extraterrestrial, we built. Now you're going. But they came fully made. That's the. 
That's the racial <laughs> anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> what? And then, see, the follow-up question is, well, how long does it take a Chicano to build a pyramid? 52 seconds. And then in front of my students, I cut, tape, da 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 and then, ta-da, a little pyramid on top of Tenochtitlan. And, um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a real pyramid, solid. You can't step on it. But anyways, th those are in the back, uh, the pop-up boom. And then we also did um, uh, a five-page, ten-point plan, and that was called El Plan de Santa Papa. And Lily has them all, I think, the, the collection. And if you don't, you'll get a whole set very soon. And uh, that one's a little bit harder to make, but I'll, I'll put the sample out there. Um, Lara Perez, I, I can't thank you enough. You, you've been in my corner, and th there's not enough. There, there, words can't describe the support you've given me. And shoot, it keeps me alive. Gets gets me jobs too. And and uh, I really thank you for for making it happen and bringing me here. It's such an honor, and I'm so elated to to be back in Berkeley. Um, Gati, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm just honored to be in your presence in this scholarly lucha that, that we do as well. Love seeing Lily, uh, Lily Castillo Speed. Uh, she was my babysitter when I was here because I spent half my time in the Chicago City Library uh, when we had that over in Wheeler, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. Wheeler. Oh gosh, I love that place. And, uh, and then it's also great seeing the Dean, uh, Alberto. Yeah. Ledesma, an author and artist, and we're, we're co-fellow artists and students here, and that, that's, uh, uh, yeah, I was joking to uh, Laura that um, uh, he, he used to mad dog me because I was a Sudeño <laughs> from Oakland, and uh, one time I asked him for a pen and he pulled out a, a, a knife on me, like, hey, 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 hey. and he said, I thought it was, I thought you asked for a weapon. I go, no, 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 pen is a weapon. That's a joke. It's not true, by the way. He was a fountain. Very sharp. Just as effective. It was a shiny fountain pen, is what I remember. Um, uh, I, I, I do want to start up a little bit. Um, uh, you know, I, I had wanted to put up here the, um, the Ashe affirmation and uh, In Lakesh. Does anyone know that In Lakesh? Chant saying, right? Look, let's recite it for those of us who, who know it. In la kesh, tu eres mi otro yo. Si te hago daño a ti, me hago daño a mí mismo. Si te amo y respeto, me amo y respeto yo. Right? And in English, how's it go? Uh, in la kesh, uh, you are my other me. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. If I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. By the way, that's a crime we just committed. The state of California Board of Ed said you cannot do that in a Chicano studies ethnic sex classroom. Uh, also the Ashe affirmation, I looked it up today. I always remember like here at Berkeley, some of my like African-American friends, Ashe, I was like, the heck is that, you know? They're like the, the Yoruba, the African, you know, spirit world, and the concept of, of Ashe, the power to make things happen. I love it, the power to make things happen. So I woke up today with, with the Ashe. Um, so trying to sound smart, I, I put this uh, title, you know, it's a, the unfolding, because this is a 10 year anniversary. Something has to be remembered. I'm so obsessed with time and like anniversaries. The 50 year anniversary of the walkouts. Let's do something. You have to remember, it's always a, an appropriate time, right? The, the, the opportune moment. The unfolding of an arts allegory movement. It's an allegory. Allegory is beautiful and powerful and, and I want to talk about that. And um, I really wanted to write like a, 10 years of pleito and chingazos contra el sistema gringo, but I thought, no, Lara will get in trouble. So we're going to ride along. Uh, uh, I think it's Alberto Cuevas from Texas drew that for us. 
I want to start off with, in the spirit of, of the ethnic studies movement right now, an ancestor acknowledgement. Ronald Takaki, uh, I'm reading his book right now. I'm teaching some of the first ethnic studies uh, intro courses in the community colleges. They're happening right now. And, and they said, well, some people read a different mirror, others do, do intro historically, or you could go just theoretically in theories and different things. And I said, yeah, I want to do that. But no, I want to honor Ronald Takaki. I sat across the table from him. When, when we, pro we, we, we would protest tons and get arrested uh, doing building takeovers to pass the uh, American cultures requirement mm -hmm. in 1989. <laughs> and Ronald Takaki was one of the few ethnic studies professors that rolled with us, was there at the protest and, and helped negotiate the American cultures requirement. And then if you read the end of, of the, uh, yeah, the conclusion of a different Mary talks about it, epistemology, but also how he wanted, he wanted um, race studies to be like integrated instead because we do things in different or different departments but there needed to be an integrated ethnic studies and then Betita oh my gosh Betita Martinez I, I, I love Betita um, we had we used to have a correspondence through letters back in the day I should dig them up but Betita was just such a I talk about a shay like making things happen she she was amazing I got, we're gonna go down memory lane, like, like, like speeding down Berkeley Hills. Look at that picture. That's what we did. We made that happen. That's hundreds, maybe close to a thousand students. You can only take this picture. Oh, you guys see that little clock tower? You know, on the walk at the end of that walk. Okay, you only, you can only take that picture if you've taken over the president's office. And that's what we did. There's my friend. We were in Che, the Chicanos in Health mm -hmm. and Education, Asian American Chicana. I, I was trying so hard to remember her name, like Susan, Susana, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, she has a question mark protest. Uh, we took it over. We, we, I got arrested about eight times um, in the, my last two years I was here. Uh, at the at '89, when I was chair of Mecha, Jeff Chang was the student body president. He was a radical. And, and he, he uh, jumped in and uh, did this. The times were so hot, weren't they? Alberto, uh, Raza, Raza Day. Oh my God, a thousand kids from the Bay Area. And we would, we would rock and roll, guacamole. Those, those, we would indoctrinate them, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's right, I said that. Republicans, we indoctrinate. Because as students, you could say anything you want, you know? Now that I'm a professor, it's allegorical. But, the, um, you know, but you know what it was? It was motivating these kids. Like, give them, like, put a fire under their butt. Like, hey, don't be out there killing each other. What the hell is that? Live for something. Look, look, at, look at this fight we're in, you know? And, and, and we would juice them up, get them all uh, in, enraged, you know? Here's uh, Isidro Macias. He's Laura. He's not crazy, is he? Not at all. He's brilliant. He's he, but he's a little Activist. out there. Yeah, from the 60s. Uh, once a law professor opened up the first tortilleria in Hawaii. Wow. Me and Lalo had to smell this engagement. Mm -hmm. I was real patriotic. I had to the American flag. Uh, th these were great times. You know, I want to point this picture out. It's a list. Sometimes you can see it. Uh, the, the, the list of demands. Okay, this is the president's office. The year before we took that picture. So they locked us out that time. <laughs> We're always trying to storm the Bastille. And it says, like, uh, the second line, American cultures, American course requirement. Um, uh, Central, U.S. out of El Salvador. ROTC off campus. That's this guy. And then, um, and then the first line, faculty diversity. That was the Mecha. Faculty diversity was the Mecha demand. We wanted bodies, we wanted money and numbers. And then, we, and then Jeff Chang and the associate students wanted American cultures. We're like, of course, let's do it. An ethics study requirement, it was already brewing before we did this. 
And then, and then the white, the white radicals, they were my friends. Everyone used to clown me. They're like, who brought those hairy white people? They're my friends though, because I was in the Central America. I got politicized in high school because my older brother was a machista. I engaged with that, um, that uh, solidarity with the Sandinistas and, and, and supporting the FMLN, the Salvadoran revolutionaries. And when I came to Berkeley, no ch Chicanos were chachos, right? Disco bunnies and mm -hmm. party animals. And we, we were like, oh, they don't know nothing about that. And it was the white radicals. It was a small group. They were cool, militant, this guy. Uh, with that, any FBI guy? This is the leader. He was really cool. He was like a James Dean, tall, older. They were older white students, and they were radical. They were real ideological, Marxist kind of, you know? And uh, John Pettis, John Pettis, uh, UC Regent, yeah. he was my boss. <laughs> Whenever I see him in these fancy places, suited up, Italian shoes, I go, look, everybody, this guy worked for me. <laughs> I was the chair, he was the treasure. He was the treasure of Mecha that year. So funny. And then finally, the Chicago Secret Service. I'm just gonna talk about the flyers. But you know, I, I am going to mention something else. I, I love this one. I, okay, this one almost went in the trash two days ago. It's, it's just old flyers laying around, but I go, I'm going to take a picture. Um, I like this one. It's at Laney College because it says Berkeley's Chicano Secret Service. Ah, I'm from Berkeley. I'm from Santa Monica, California, West LA. Lalo did this beautiful drawing on time. And, and we had this, we we're trying to develop a philosophy of the Mad Chicano, and it has this beautiful, uh, it should be a poster, a little uh, yeah. essay. Um, I, did, I did these two flyers myself. I was behind that car. No, I wasn't. I was not. This is uh, at the LA Uprisings. And, and that year we did um, our first show at Troy Cafe. Uh, Tomas Carrasco wrote his dissertation and writes about Troy Cafe. And th this one's uh, 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 in Chicago. I love it. Uh, the Rafael Cintron Center it says, watch out. You better watch out, you're in Chicago. But uh, fun times. Um, one thing about, uh, I did want to mention, I walked by um, former Eshelman Hall, where the clubs were at, and the, um, oh, I had the oldest elevator. It, it was uh, it was like punk rock opera. It was. Um, you get the elevator. It, it, no one even allows this to happen anymore. And you'd go up the elevator, and it would go, and then go, like the elevator. And then the doors would open. Sometimes they would. You'd have to like get. Sometimes you have to push them together, and they would go, boom, and they would crash together like that. And se nos ocurrió. Uh, I, I want. I have a picture of it. I couldn't find it, but I, I want uh, so do, to do a mural, one of a kind. No one's ever done this before, I think. And on one of the uh, elevator doors, I, I did a fist right up to the edge of the door, and I put Chicano power, the fist. And Lalo, who was a trained cartoonist, drew Ronald Reagan, because when we were here, <laughs> they were the last years of Ronald Reagan, and he was an a hole, right? And he drew, it took him like two, two trips to finish the face. And he drew Ronald Reagan really good. And with the, his little face scrunchy. And so any time, and it stayed up there for like a year and a half. <laughs> Boom! And then like, Chicano power, and then Ronald Reagan smack on the nose. <laughs> a Chicano mural, right here. Only Chicanos could do that, right? I remember these two. I don't remember their name. She was like an artist. He was so cool. He was like an engineer. Nothing seemed like nothing political. He would come out to all the stuff. This is a Malakias Montoya talk. Malakia. And I want to emphasize the talks. These people just like graced us with so much language and culture and wisdom. <laughs> this poster, we tacked them up. Malakias Montoya. That's at the Smithsonian Museum now. And they were so gracious to us. Uh, Jose Montoya gave a talk at Casa Joaquin. I brought him in as a sophomore, and I bent through his face and did a flyer. And I love making flyers. And um, 
he, he did a slideshow, so I'm kind of emulating his slideshow. He, and you know in his slideshow, and he had us captivated, uh, and then a little baby picture would come pop out. He goes, oh, that's my, that's my daughter. You know, and I was like, the hell is that? You know, and, and then, oh, that's Wanishi. Uh, uh, and Wanishi is like a big time artist now. And it was like a baby in diapers or something. Like, what's he doing? <laughs> He's like, ha ha. He was just staring at me. And I was like, oh my God. What? And, um, but, but uh, you know, I, I want to tie this to the work of Tati de los Rios, intergenerational learning, yeah. activism. You know, teach, especially with technology, we gotta bring everyone together. The kids are out, you know, are on this, and so are some of us. We are too a little bit, but it's uh, so so important. It's my daughter, my mijo. What was that little uh, across from Strada? It used to be a Christian uh, uh, host, hostel or housing. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I don't know what it is now. It yeah, it might be. Huh? Yeah, it, it was that housing. Yeah, my sister lived there. This is my son. Oh, he's so cute. My sister did her PhD in Ed here. So, so the Serenas and, and my, some of my cousin, one of my cousins went here. He's a lawyer now. Uh, look how precious. This is so precious and cute. Uh, she's 17. She doesn't look so precious now, but she still is. But uh, it, it is about that preciousness too. You know, it's so special. Uh, it's um, it, it reminds me of this intergenerational unity we need, you know, and and the family. For me, the geez, this is me, a junior, with my uh, San Francisco moratorium T-shirt on from Berkeley, in Santa Monica. My mama, my mama's elderly, very frail. We're all la estamos cuidando, so I want to give thanks to her and. Uh, psh, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna cry, I ain't, but I could. <laughs> but there's just so much, my sister's taking care of my mom right now. We all, we all chip in. Uh, my mom was widowed when we were young. And so it made us really unidos, you know? And so that, that I don't know where I'd be without that unity. But uh, I came up here out of high school, an 18 year old, and um, you know, I, I, I I rebelled against the family, but the family's just, you can't really rebel against the whole family. I think this, this time period, just to take a little time jump though, is um, the um, Arizona kind of uh, uh, set the fire, it, it set the prairie fire that we're still under. The, the attack on Tucson's Rasa Studies Now program I, I started going to these conferences before the attack because I was like, wow, what are they doing over there? They got a whole pro, my uh, Johnny Ramirez and Selena. Ramirez, I think is also her last name. Ramirez is, this must be a plot. And they uh, took us over there from LA and we, we started going and this program was amazing. Gati and I, I met Gati, she was speaking, she was, uh, they were also bringing during the summer educational scholars and uh, people that were doing ethnic studies in high schools. And it was just uh, really powerful. That's John Avalos, John Avalos Rios, who came out in Zoot Suit, one of the featured dancers in Zoot Suit. Beautiful man, my gay Chicano friend. He, he always calls me my straight Chicano friend, so I'm just throwing it back. Uh, that's us in the courtroom. We started, started taking him to Tucson, and, and we just, we, we became like cult members of the movement. We helped organize this. This is the morning, 6 a.m. morning uh, sunrise ceremony. Louis Gutierrez, who has a, his family owns a panaderia and a mission, did the dancing, the Aztec dancing, and so did Alex. Alex G went, went to sociology grad school here. His, the Oakland dancers and the San, San Pancho dancers were there. And that was also like a magical moment. This is the Ninth District Court of Appeals. This is when, this is the Battle of Puebla. You know, the South, the, the enslavers are winning, and then the rebellion starts happening. And then Puebla, this is Puebla, we win. Uh, uh, the, the judges threw it back to Arizona. 
And then in 2017, I put 20, because that's when the, the teachers win the lawsuit and Arizona is legally charged with racism, institutionalized racism, racial animus is the term. And they're also my doctoral years. So they become part of my, my research and Plato rhetoric and it's informing everything. And now you have to get involved. This should have happened a lot earlier. We need to start a rally. So I'm gonna say, you can ban Chicano books, and then you say, but they still pop up. You can ban Chicano books, but they still pop up. You can ban Chicano books, but they still pop up. Let's take over the president's office now. Let's go back up. I knew you were down. I knew, I knew something was down. I, but I don't want to make Lalo look bad. <laughs> I'm leaving now. <laughs> just calling the, calling the Berkeley. <laughs> I'm calling your mother. <laughs> so this is just, in, in, a, in a nutshell, this is kind of like our timeline. But there is a little creation story that I'll get to. And um, these little books, uh, I, I like to think of them as allegories, these symbolic stories because they banned the books, and then, and then we made these pop-up books, and, and then it just starts, there almost wasn't a sequence that you can make sense of. It, it's like, um, oh yeah, they're banning the books, but they're gonna pop up. Well, let's, oh, let's take that, let's carry that banner. And then the allegory starts taking on more meaning, and it's um, the spreading of ethnic studies. Because you know the original allegory was Chicago Studies is going to come back in Tucson. It's coming back. And it does not, y'all. That, that destruction of MAS killed it. Because when you kill something, you also ruin the fiber and the relationships, teachers. People sell out. The, the you know, the, what are the, the scabs, right? Someone takes the money and goes to work for the district and start something new, fresh and new. Not nah, fresh and new, you, you, you got bought. You know, and then, and then uh, padrinos, best friends. Oh, that's the worst, man. Seeing best friends just want to kill each other. And it's like, we shouldn't be like that, but the system did that to us. It's trauma, you know? And so, uh, that first allegory did not come true. Chicago says still has not come back to Arizona. And then we said, well, you know what? We're going to spread it then, you know? And it was kind of like the Zapatistas used to tell the Chicanos, don't come down to the jungle, pick up arms. <laughs> You're going to do it. Go, go do, sweep your own front door. Sweep your own house. Go back and do the work there. So we said, all right, we're going to come to California. Spread it. And it, it happened. It happened. And so the spreading of ethnic studies, there was a second allegory. And then it's like these things that start happening. Ron Espiritu started teaching black and brown his, hidden histories. Mm. He even asked us, can I do that? Could do anything you want. Yeah, do it, that sounds great. Yeah, it makes sense, a hidden history, you pop it up. And then the quincentennial rolled around, <coughs> I was obsessed. I almost turned into an Aztec, almost. I fully decolonized for like a few weeks. I, I was completely decolonized. I even had a chant. I had it somewhere. Let me see if I have it. Because I do want to hex you guys a little bit. I was going to try it. I can't find it. But if I remember it, I'll, I'll say it. It was kind of like, um, it was kind of like, um, oh, here it is. This is done by Che Castro the most radical Chicano in Aslan, a Chicano Secret Service character. It, it's a little, uh, it's paraphrased. Um, it's an incantation of complete decolonization in a pre nahuatl language. This is before the Aztec you know, empires and coercion. And it goes something like this. In Sochi in Cuica, Sochi Pili Alabanza, Hibiri jibiri, and el chiquihuite. Wiri wiri wiri, woo woo woo. Awakal, contostal. 
en el chiquihuite para que se te quite. Thank you. That's a Chicano completely decolonized incantation. Uh, so that happened during the quincentennial. I was obsessed. Uh, the Tenochtitlan. line. And then, uh, and then John Aglo started working with BLM. And BLM, oh, again, uh, my colleagues think presence effects from Ulrich Gumbrecht, my tío. No, he's not. He's a, 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 a humanities philosopher, ideologue, uh, <coughs> uh, Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht. Uh, Boris Nunley turned us on to him. Production of presence. He argued that uh, literature, literary analysis, and the humanities is in, is in it only about interpretation. It's also like things you can interpret, like feelings, you know, uh, uh, reactions, visceral responses. The production of presence effects. And so John Avlo started working with BLM and the police families. Uh, families, and then he would make pop-up books to resurrect the family member, the, the, the young man's, usually, it was a, usually a young man of color, black or brown, the young man's life struggle for justice. So the pop-up book had, had a, a BLM police uh, killings, violence um, allegory, right? And then he himself started writing his story just in the last a year or two, some students were doing LGBTQ coming out allegory. So that was another layer, another dimension of the pop-up book, like what it came to represent. And so there was this Chicano pop-up book versatility that was happening. And I think it has everything to, to do with today's bands. I'm gonna try to glide through some of these because I do want to have some Q&A time. And, um, uh, this is the bookshelf, <laughs> the bookcase at uh, Tomas Rivera Library. Uh, and this is how it all starts, because I win, in 2013, I win uh, the, the book. This is how you're supposed to say it. Ron Espirito told me. At, at UC Riverside, I won first place in the uh, book collecting contest. And then uh, the librarian told me, send it to the National. Uh, clean it up send it next week, so I sent it. And the Library of Congress awarded me, yours truly, first place in the National Book Collecting Contest. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have to do that. Little rascals. And um, I asked, and, and, then, and then the librarian told me, I, and I should remember her name, but I don't. She said, do a display, everyone does it. I go, of course, I love that kind of stuff, you know? And, and, and John Alvo said, oh, I, I asked him, I go, help me. You know, sarapes, las chingaderas, you know, all the mitos, you know, let's make a, just so people look at it. He goes, I'll make pop-up books. Because uh, he, he went to arts and crafts college up here too, or training. He's part of that 70s. Uh, Ella knows all about this. A lot of the Chicano artists in the 70s attended, what well, the, the big? Not called to arts and crafts, but they got rid of the crafts. Uh, what? It's, it's Calvary Plaza Art. Yeah, but, but, but back in the day, like art, uh, crafts teaching were big. And so he's, he made pop up books, and that's it. It just, then it took off from there. And, um, and uh, it's also a, a, a discipline, right? It's informed by art, literature, history. But importantly, Chicano studies. This is one of the few lessons. Because it really becomes a curriculum plan, a lesson. And if anyone's interested, let me know. I should have a sign-in sheet or something, but I could send you a little, we have a little curriculum packet. And importantly, it's ethnic studies. It comes out of, this, this whole thing comes out of a movement. It wasn't out of a, a book or anything. It came out of a movement. Look at these precious, such important books to us. They're so important to us. A uh, crime. They made our culture a crime. Mm -hmm. You have the manifesto. Mm -hmm. um, Lalo did this beautiful cartoon, so layered and deep, 
It's the um, 2281 was an anti-ethnic studies initiative in Arizona. And then, the, see, the allegory is, is uh, the, the simplest definition is, it's a symbolic story. People will go, what's allegory? You know, the parables in the Bible. Oh, okay, yeah, Mr. Cristiano over there. No, I'm just playing. Um, but there, you know, these, uh, the Jesus stories, those are also allegories within allegories sometimes. Uh, and then that uh, Cantillian called it one thing in words, another in meaning. Critical race theory does a whole other beautiful thing with allegory. It's like a counter story to challenge racism. But the, um, um, oh, and then by the way, look how layered, you know, it's, it's the burning of books. But then what is it also? Like with the face, the anthropomorphic scale, what does that make you think of? Thank you. Yeah, Salem. Witch trials, witch burnings. Uh, like Gross Vogel says, one of the epistemicides, the, mm -hmm. the killing of female knowledge. And then it's also that the, the fourth ep ep uh, epistemicide, the, the burning of the books. Mm -hmm. So there's the indigenous, there's that quincentennial uh, message there too, right? They said when they, would bur when they would burn the books, they would also sometimes get the Tlamatini man, the writer, the shaman, and tie the books around them and, and put them up on the stake. Imagine that. Woo. Trauma, right? But it's such a beautiful layered uh, image that was. And then there's this, again, presence effects. Uh, the, the history of allegory goes back to priesthoods everywhere. China, Greece, Mesoamerica, the Christians, right? And, and for us former, I'm a reformed Catolico, like a reformed Cholo, like Alberto right here. <laughs> reformed Catolico or the Cristianos, you know. Uh, well, it's the Catholic Church, the, 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 you know, readings from the Bible, from the book. And then that's, the liturgy is followed by the homily, the lecture. And in the lecture, the priest is supposed to reveal the deeper meaning of the, of the text. And then we're all supposed to go, oh. But some of us go, <laughs> Start snoring. Kai, levántate, way. Ay, sorry. <laughs> Fell asleep during the liturgy. How embarrassing. Uh, but the um, but that revelation, you know, a good priest is supposed to bring out that deeper meaning and oh wow, a presence effect, a uh, a uh, 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 ha moment, a wow moment. And then Gumbrich says that part of the presence effect is also. You know, out of out of nothing, something. You know, like but there's nothing in here. It's flat. And then out of nothing, something. You know, and uh, that's it. That that was, then we, I realized. Oh wow! Upon deeper analysis, the Chicano pop-up book is a uh, moment of presence effect. So, uh, another level of allegory for the lucha, you know? And then there were several allegories, although we weren't calling them that or <clears throat> thinking of them, of them like that. In the morning I read somewhere, you know, the arts and, oh, the ashe, I was reading about the ashe, and arts and, um, Laura, you, you, you know this, you write about this, ritual, arts and ritual go, go so together hand in hand. I think that's also what's going on. So we have the epistemicide, this burning of books going on, the banning. Uh, uh, Saintly, Dr. Saintly was saying this is civilizational warfare. There's no different from when they burned our books 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was like, you're right, mm -hmm. right? And then the seed, you can plant uh, in, in uh, the, the Chicanos of Tucson were really into Mesoamerica. They were informed also by Tupac, the Chicano uh, uh, leader, organizer, philosopher out there, and they would talk about the Chinachi. So Chicano studies plants that Chinachi, right? And it, you put it in, and they're like, eh, I hate this clan. Oh, that was kind of interesting. And then later on, I'm going to be a Chicano lawyer for a pueblo, you know? It's like the Chinachi sprouts, right? And then, and then they have the, a methodology, the Chicano paradigm, based on 
you know, th this concept of, of energies. The, educate, the purpose of education wasn't to supply, you know, the capitalist system with, you know, a diverse, educated, managerial workforce. It was to self-reflect, put the mirror, like uh, teachers had to put the mirror, and, and so the students can engage in the precious knowledge, and through dialogue, go into precious knowledge, and the books were precious knowledge, and, and then put that into uh, work, praxis, the will to act, and then it was going to lead to transformation, and then back again, you know, just a whole world, world of these four energies, and that was an allegory that was working. But with regards to the quincentennial, you have the book burners that we should be aware of. Diego de Landa, the first Arizona legislatures. But they're really the colonizers, you know. Uh, Edward Said um, kind of wrote about that, the scholarly invasions. When they went into the Middle East, they always had the librarians, the people studying and writing about the Middle East, inventing the Middle East in order to control it. And that's preceded, Said never talks about that, but that's preceded by us, by what happens to us, right? The Spaniards writing, you know, there's the paradoxes. He burns all the Mayan books. Some of the priests are like, that's a crime. And they throw him in jail. And you know how he gets out of jail? He writes, uh, he writes the book. You got that before and after the conquest. He, and he becomes an expert on Maya knowledge. But you just burned all the Maya knowledge. That's not important, right? And so, and, and, and uh, De Landa is taking cues from Sumaraga, the first bishop of Mexico, who goes to Texcoco. You know, Tenochtitlan is probably like a war zone, like Libya or Afghanistan, better comparison. It, it's destroyed, and they go into Texcoco, the other great city on the other side of the lake, and they burn the library there. Uh, Sumaraga does, you know, and then he brings the first printing press because it's pro-ethnic studies, and, and, and he creates the first public library. All of the Mesoamericans already had libraries, and so that history of book burning, and this is an excellent. Uh, there's a really beautiful ten-page chapter in. Uh, uh, Fernando Baez's Universal History of the Burning of Books. Excellent chapter on book burning in the Americas. And so we started teaching. One of my favorite books was Graciela Limon, all these beautiful themes. And, and, and that, this is a quincentennial book. So this was a book I was reading in my uh, Chicano Lit, Intro to Chicano Lit class. We had a ball with it. And there's several, there's a bunch of student work on the break. I want everyone to just, uh, you know, I wanted a, there's a few of them opened, but it's really best to have them laid out and you can open them yourself and get that, get that presence feeling. I, I'm just going to fly through this. Uh, uh, this is the jewel of Anahuac. Graciela uh, Limon said that something similar to what happened to, um, Leslie Marmon Silco happened to her. She's writing the book and then the energies just come in. They take over. And, and she wrote about a, a, a woman uh, from the noble class that, that falls. So she goes from this, she's like one of the most beautiful uh, young women in Tenochtitlan and lives through, she's 18 when the invaders arrive. So crazy, like all the, the, the uh, symbolization, you know, of, of like, and, and that's what they said about uh, Tenochtitlan, that it was, it's the last big Mesoamerican city, and that it's just like a jewel, it's like this flourishing, it's like a flower about to bud, you know, and then, you know, the, the invaders arrive and just, just utterly destroy the beauty of it, and, and uh, Graciela Limon calls it, she says, it, we used to call it the jewel of Anahuac, and my mom remembers it. Una ciudad entre el agua. Wow, like Atlantis, you know. Must have been like the most beautiful city. Oh, this one came out. Oh, there, there's great old school maps. Uh, 
Uh, that, that's an imagined aerial view. Six miles of bridges. Um, just the, so we, we got lost in there. I know there's a lot of um, human sacrifice. Tortas de sesos. <laughs> eyeball, sopa de, o, de eyeball, ojos. Ojotitos o ojos grandes, kid. You know, um, but that, that, see, that's, that's how we've been socially conditioned. The Aztecs, oh no, don't, no, don't, I'm Catholico. You know, but there's this wonder, and, and we got lost in the wonder. And all the elements, the beautiful urban planning, the second largest marketplace in the planet, first one might have been in China at the time. The Chinampas, all the water architecture, the aqueduct bringing fresh mountain spring water down uh, through an aqueduct across the lake and popping out hydraulically into the fountains and temples of, of the city. And it's the city's about, it's about half the size of Berkeley, but that's huge, you know? Um, there's all these elements, the Amochicali, the ball courts, the escuelas, the university, the Carneca. So it made us think of space structures. So we, one of my students made these, this amazing house that <laughs> popped up. The students started making amazing things. It's all influenced also by Bonfil Bataya. Well, are we Indian? Bonfil Bataya says, you know, the, um, I love the repertoire. There's a quote on the, the repertoire of the Mestizo Pueblos no different than the indigenous repertoire. We're, we're Indian, we're indigenous, right? And we don't even know. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. Okay. Student work, the Shakwi Templo, reinterpreting it too, right? But the, re the, the, the structure the sculpture of Golshakwi at the bottom of, of the Templo Mayor is coercive and, and, and oh my God, so misogynistic and, and, and militaristic at the same time, right? And, and then, you know, the Chicana feminists, we read about that, uh, of, especially of the 90s, reinterpret Golshakwi, remembering Golshakwi, uh, acknowledging the disparate struggles of Chicanas. Uh, mujeres, Latinas. Um, Golshak, we pay a lot of, a lot of Chicanas, Latinas would, would, would do uh, Golshak, we pop ups. It's really beautiful. Um, you know, later on in the workshop, I'm going to go through uh, the, the, these used to be little <clears throat> videos, but um, they flattened out on the Google slides. I love this. This one's out there. Oh, one of my Central American Studies students. Hassan, <laughs> he, he would say the funniest things. He really brilliant things, not funny, brilliant. And uh, he he compared. Oh, we're always always supposed to make a, a connection to the present in the prompt, and it was two paragraphs and a quote from. I think we were reading. We're, this time we're reading uh, David Carrasco's pamphlet, the hundred page pamphlet, The Aztecs: A Short Introduction. And he compared the pilgrimage from Aslan to Tenochtitlan with the pilgrimage of the Hondureños from, and he was Honduran, from Central America to the U.S. I was like, poof. I was like, wow. That was good. That was really, really good. The versatility, you know, of, of the allegory. We'll get to that. And, and I'm going to just finish up. Um, you know, I already talked about these different levels of, of adaptation <laughs> of the Chicano pop-up book allegory that starts with it. And John Avalos, one of his first, he, had, he, he taught a dance class. And I love this guy. You, you know when you tell someone, hey, you want to uh, do a pop-up book project with your class? No, 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 I can't. I can't. I just, it doesn't fit. This, my syllabus is... Doesn't make sense. But you're teaching a class on arts and literature. No, no, I'm sorry, it's just so deep. There's that kind of friend. And then there's the other friend that's like, 
I teach a dance class. Yes, I'll do pop-up looks with my dancers. I was like, how? How are you going to do it? And he did it. He, he did that, and the students made these giant pop-up looks. I can do Chicano. And then he, um, I don't know exactly how, but he started getting involved with Black Lives Matter and the uh, 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 victims of police brutality. And he started meeting the family members. He would know the family members. And we started making pop-up, giant pop-up books with um, some of our, our workshops. And he would make the pop-up books for a specific family. And he would give the book to the family to uplift them, you know, to resurrect that struggle, keep that struggle alive. Because a lot of them could get dejected. I mean, your child has been, like, viciously murdered by the law enforcement. And this is how they would end a meeting at police commission. This happens every week, by the way. And, um, and so, um, you know, it took on new meaning. We did one for the Semillas, the uh, uh, Aztec school in, in uh, El Sereno, East LA. And then, uh, after, this is from um, Ron Espiritu's, he, he taught a class called uh, African American and Chicano Studies together. Mm -hmm taught at South Central, and his students would do, um, we do have TUSD, um, Ethnic Studies, Feminist, Pop-Up Book, the students would choose their own topic, LGBTQ movements, Hidden Histories that they weren't learning about, Black Lives Matters Pop-Ups, uh, Trayvon Martin, and then there was this magical moment. I remember we, uh, he invited us to present to his students and we told him, hey, we're going to, um, we're going to, this is an opportunity to make a great pop-up book, y'all. We were always trying to stir things up. Coming out of that Trump era, I remember John Avalos saying like, gosh, my students are all sad and depressed and like all asustados. And I'm like, man, we need to screw all this like evaluation and papers and reading and papers and reading like let's have some fun let's make kids laugh you know let's let's joke around let's let's make students want to come to class and so we told these students hey this is gonna be a you know we got all riled up high school students they're fun to work with they were like we're gonna make us the stage is already there y'all the lights are gonna pop on a million people are gonna see your books if you know we do this right and and they believed us you know and they got into it and around the end of the semester npr latino usa called me up and they're like hey can you do an interview on teaching um Chicago's ethnic studies in high schools i go no i can't because i'm not teaching at the high school right now but call ron espiritu and they called ron they set up an interview and then they came with the cameras it was part of the radio program on latino usa and they took pictures posted it on the national website millions of people heard and saw it and we were like wow oh my gosh it happened we just said it and then <laughs> prophecies right it was a beautiful beautiful moment and we we're popping up all over at different schools in la county los angeles south central and then we we're going national it was Tucson and LA up to the Bay. We had folks in the Bay, El Paso. Uh, we were up on the East Coast, St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah, it was fun. It was getting Denver. Some teachers in Denver started doing it. Mexico City had it, had it cracking. And then we were just part of that whole ethnic studies movement. And there's a big shout out to the Bay because the week before LAUSD passed, San Francisco Unified passed an ethnic studies requirement in their district. Then LAUSD passed, El Rancho had passed it, a smaller one. And then that's the earthquake. This is 27, 16 or 17, I think. And then psh, the earthquake, the big one hits, and all the districts start uh, taking, you know, creating ethnic studies courses and requirements and programs. And then the Alejo bill passes them in California. The state legislator follows the movement, and um, and yeah, that's you know, um, and I wanted to connect it to 
you know, this book ban today in Florida, Texas. A friend of mine, I talked in a class at UTSA in Texas on Monday on Zoom, and my friend Olga Estrada out there, she showed me the list. She goes, it's a 16 page list. I go, wow, that's crazy. She showed me the list, it's like in 10 font. They amassed like hundreds of books to ban. Mostly African American stuff, African American, Black Lives Matters, and LGBTQ and uh, YA, young, young adult books. To ban, I was like, wow, oh my goodness. And then we, we're not free, y'all. Like they banned Ashe and the In Like Esh. So it's a real thing that's going on right now. And, and I want to end with two chants, just like the Lotus Huerta taught me. Um, we'll, we'll do that. The, the, you can ban Chicano books and then there's one that went like this at the very end you say fight back this is a chant that was done by the LAUSD kids on that on that day at, at um, the LAUSD headquarters the, these black and brown kids they start walking around the bullhorn and they, this, this young ki these kids would go um, if my skin or my hoodie are probable cause we need ethnic studies not racist laws with black and brown people under attack. We need to fight, 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 fight back. back. That's, that's the cue, right? So if my skin or my hoodie are probable cause, we need ethnic studies, not racist laws. With black and brown people under attack, we need to fight, fight, fight. Fight, fight back. Fight, fight, fight. Fight back. You can ban Chicano books, they still pop up. up. You can ban Chicano books, they still pop up. Thank you very much, y'all. Uh, and I wanted to you know, end with a little Q&A. Any questions, comments? Um, uh, I'm, I'm very I'm open and welcome to any of that. Yeah. And that was a lot, huh? That was brilliant. Oh, thank you. Whew. I should have, that was the time that I take a deep breath. Yes, Ella, thank so you. I have a question. Um, I'm really interested in, uh, as someone that studied the 60s and 70s in terms of the art and moving the movement forward, um, it has been a fascinating moment when you become an historical context and it's just the aging process. But for me, it started with Adolfo's, um, uh, I'm not from LA, the, La the LAs that he oh. did on um, Oscar and the, the Rebel Radio out of UC Davis. Adolfo Guzman Lopez, yeah. thank you. And I, that's not my era. I'm a, I'm a, don't mean to make you feel uncomfortable, but I'm a little younger than you. And so, I know that. <laughs> but my point is, is, I wasn't in college in the 90s. I was just in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. So I really missed out on that part. But it's really interesting as a scholar in the 60s and 70s, we really always point to you know, the, the third world liberation mm -hmm. front, and then we tell the story of ethnic studies or Chicano studies from that point on. But it seems like the 90s and the early 2000s now are being remembered um, as, as sort of your activist generation now. And it seems what, that's what's interested, or what the students are interested in, they're really looking at the 80s and 90s. And so, with all mm -hmm. of that said, it, it's a fascinating time for new scholarship. It's a fascinating time for new teaching, but what are some, um, just as someone that was a part of that and then also a scholar yourself, like what, what are some of the reflections on this sort of now visibility of that like late 80s and then all 90s and early 2000s memory? Because there's a lot of students coming forward that are doing their reflections on that era more so than yeah. The 60s and 70s. Yeah. What's that's that like? Denial. <laughs> I was only 10 years old. <laughs> and by the way, everyone, I'm, I'm so sorry. This is Ella Diaz, the chair of uh, San Jose State Chicago Studies Department, Chicago <laughs> Studies. And it's an honor. You know, we're good friends. It's an honor to be here. And uh, you've written so much on some of my favorite artists, my, on Jose Montoya. Well, and that's who inspires Chicano Secret Service and yourself. And I see a lot of connections with you and Jose. Yeah. Um, and then when you showed the Malakias uh, poster, that's from 72, but then he redoned that in 2012 mm -hmm. with Jesus Barraza. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm kind of talking about. Like, what's it yeah. like to be in this sort of, 
I mean, the downside is that the movement, the cycles continue. Like, you have to hold the good and the bad. Like, why has the fight been ongoing, like you said? And then to hear, and then to engage with students that are meeting you at where you are and where they are, but then you have this other history behind you. That's kind of what, if that makes any sense. I'm just real curious about what it's like to both be a part of history and then be the historical class. Oh, I know. That's a, a labyrinthic question there. No, of course. You know, putting the slides together, it made me think of that. Like, when, when Malakias came and showed his slides and Jose, Casa Joaquin, uh, you'd see those Chicano movement and TWLF posters, and we're like, wow, that was so long ago. Yeah. It's only 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, around that time. 20, was it? Yeah. yeah. Less than 20, actually, to be technical. But uh, even then, it was like, oh, so long ago. But now I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was, it was the Chicano movement was fresh still. It was like it, the, the, um, the, the things about it were still the structures, some of those positive structures. Ch Chicano studies, Chicanx studies, right, was still uh, vibrant and fresh, you know. But who had, as 19, 20 year olds, we were like, oh, so long ago, you know. But, but now there's like this stretch of time. And so, you know, we, we do our best to encompass it. I do my best, but, you know, honestly, there's also part of being an activist or being an activist, scholar, artist, artivist, is you don't you don't think about that. Mm -hmm. We're just like boom, boom, like working through it. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a, a lack of that self-reflection. But I'm glad, mm -hmm. you know, um, Gathi and I were talking about this at La Strada earlier, like the fabric. Right now is such an important time to pay attention to the fabric mm. of, of Chicano um, Latinx studies because mm. it, 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 went a, it went ahead. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was blocking the mic during some of this. But the, um, uh, with this ethnic studies requirement and the state passing it, ethnic studies possibilities kind of went mm. into the out in front all by itself. So right now it's getting arrows, mm -hmm. it's getting shot at. Mm -hmm. And people are patching things up and doing and improvising and the, con the consulting of ethnic studies is going on. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's kind of almost taken on a little bit of like a, almost like a corporate mm -hmm. spin or model of how to teach ethnic studies. The consultants will teach the whole school, all the teachers, but mm -hmm. it's important right now to get to, to really focus on the fabric. That's why I appreciate, really appreciate Gathi's work on intergenerational uh, learning and epistemology and, and pedagogy, right? Because we need to pay attention to like how we do Chicanx studies. What is Chicanx studies? And it's, and it, it's, it's the tradition, it's part of the tradition, and then it's, it's not, it, it's gotta be new. It's gotta be digital. It's gotta be intergenerational. Um, I really appreciated the presentation. Um, I guess I did fantastic as usual. I mean, you've always been brilliant. Um, and uh, one, one thing, and your question uh, really kind of triggered this. Um, even back, uh, you know, when we were students, um, I think that Chicano studies uh, was experienced in very different ways because the Chicano community was very diverse. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there were Chicanos who were more recently arrived than others. Um, and there were some of us who were in Northern California, some of us who were uh, Southern California. Small town, city slick. Small town, you know, and, and I think that, that you know, the, the way that Chicano identity, in terms of this nationalistic kind of evocation, um, it was felt very differently within that, that milieu, within that, that community. And I think, you know, today, even today, um, the community continues to be diverse and re-energized by new immigrant uh, uh, communities that continue to arrive. I can see. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that the complexities of the community, um, you know, a, a lot of what's happening in the racialized politics of the day um, are affecting the community in, in, in different ways. I was invited to do some presentations in, in Arizona um, in, 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 with a book that is both read as 
uh, Chicano Latino um, in, in many ways, but it's also read as an immigrant text. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that was really, really interesting was, you know, how the audience, you know, um, that the students, some of them felt themselves um, that they were reading the book in a very siloed way, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm born here and here's how I'm reading it, versus the immigrant students who are undocumented who are reading the book mm. in, a, in another way. And so I think that, that that was something that, to me, that the, the, the you know, a lot of the debate, you know, the, when we talk about epistemologies, the epistemologies are, you know, um, you know, there's a matrix of experience that, 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 is, that is presented there. Mm -hmm. and there's, a, there's a lot of constituencies. Nice, and I'm glad you're bringing out like interpretation, yeah. because it's like any like song writers and writers know this. You put something out, and you're like, I want it to go there, yeah. and then it, it goes there. You know, it's a love song, and they're like, but everyone starts playing it at funerals because it goes so well, and it's like it's not a funeral hymn, but it's the audience reinterprets things sometimes. But yeah, it's like even this, well, and that's. Chicano studies too, like it, you, you, you read the books, you do, you, you, it's important though, maybe like um, got the emphasizes, like the uh, teach the processes, the principles, community, engaging with community, you know, praxis, action, you know, and then, and then the students, they're going to do something else with it, but they're going to do the, the they're going to, they're going to, Learn that that those methods maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, for me, uh, one of the big things about you know, um, particularly in terms of that dynamics of of um, of um, let's say uh, uh, activism and and <coughs> the legacy of of, of, of uh, Chicano studies is that particularly with some immigrant communities that where ethnic studies resonates quite a bit, yeah. the agency around the ac activism is not always a given, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and especially more currently, you know, um, you know, DACA-fied students, you know, might be, <coughs> be more active than non daca students, you know? Yeah. So, so, yeah, so maybe. yeah, no, right. No, we want everyone to be insurgent revolutionaries some of us aren't. No, but you know, it's like everyone does their action and their own method. I think that, you know, as I get older, it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's you, you create a tool and then people do, do, do what they need to do with that tool in a way, yeah. I mean, you know, that's a whole nother allegory, right? Like living, I love the, um, cause I was in Ame when I was a high school teacher at Samo High, Santa Monica High School, um, Association of Mexican American Educators. And for a whole year, we had this motto, out of the shadows, because a lot of our, our Latinx, Mexicano, Chicano yeah. students are, you know, they're kind of like shy, you know, you know, I'm here, yeah. And it's like, man, the laws did this to us. Mm -hmm. The uh, Trump era did this to us. You know, the, the, the young people kind of shy away, and, and, and it's spaces like, a Chicanx studies class that'll like give them the the space to, to, to speak out to do right. to study these these um, legacies these traditions. Yeah. I kind of want to hear a question from a student. All the adults hogging up my time. I pay my tuition fees. I need to talk. Maybe we can end with a a, a student comment or question. Uh, an undergrad? Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's more of a comment. Yeah. Um, I like what you just said right now, how um, Chicano or ethnic studies really makes, as a student, an impact of making you more confident, because I personally mm -hmm. have felt that, you know, uh, whenever I'm in any Chicano studies class or ethnic studies class, I always feel, a little, my chest will pop up, I have questions, I have uh, opinions, I say this, I, I feel more engaged rather when it's courses when I, I don't see myself or I, I can feel myself shrink and I just have that self-reflection moment where I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? I can see myself, but I, that's why I think it's so important
That's sweet. Um, you made me think of something, and you know, I thought I'd made a slide about it, um, and I'll end. I, I want to respond to that. Um, that was one of the. Oh, this one. I forgot to mention, like, you know, in the Plan de Santa Barbara, th there was a beautiful chapter. I have my students read it um, because it, it contains a lot of the early principles, tenets of Chicano studies, and um, Juan Gomez Quinones and. There's a, uh, I, I, I work with them. He, he passed away a few years ago. And uh, there's a lot of beautiful poetics in there. And, and at the end of that chapter, it says, we need to start seeing this university like our university. Our people get exploited through labor. We pay taxes. We work, we sweep up the whole damn university. You know, we pay into it too. Don't get it wrong, don't get it twisted, you know? And, and, and th not only that, this, this university owes us. So we're gonna demand those research centers, those Chicano libraries, the classrooms, the hires, the faculty hires, and, and we're, gonna, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna decide who we hire, or no program at all. I love that, that little phrase repeats. If it's not, if we're not controlling it, then better, no program at all, you know? Self-determination. But at the end of the chapter, it's like our university. And that's something that, that when we were students, I think uh, Chicano studies classes, Chicanx studies classes were teaching us that. And, and the talks, the talks, the stories were telling us that. And so we went out there and we started taking over buildings. And, and I, I gotta end with this story. We, we're taking over a building. <laughs> Eddie Leroy is biracial Chicano. Good friends with my homie, uh, Marco Fireball is in this picture. He was the, the state assemblyman. He passed away uh, about 10 years back. He was my road dog. We were really close. Went to Mexico City together in San Diego de la Rosa. And, and we're, in, we're, we're marching through uh, the history of uh, Duanel. We're like, oh, we would surprise attack the departments. We're like, we're, we're demanding faculty diversity, and, and we don't know which department's going to get hit today but you are gonna get hit. And so all the departments are like, oh shit, what the? And so we're march we marched through to now, pounded on history, then the plan was go back up to um, Barrels and take over Poli Sci, mm -hmm. and which we did. But we went into the history department, we're like, we want diversity, we want it now. We're all, and Eddie Leroy was on the door of the history department. He's like, bam, bam. We want diversity. We want it now. You know where there's about 150 of us, maybe 100 of us, in a hallway. And the chair of the history department swings the door open. And it's one of those beautiful you know, glass windows, history department. He's like, what the hell are you doing pounding on my door? And he's an older white man in a suit. And all I remember is Eddie Leroy is like, Oh, I wait. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I got a white man angry. And, and all of us, we're, we're Mexicans. You know, we don't do that. And, and for a moment, a split moment, he got us. He got us good. We're like, oh, wait. <laughs> sorry, sorry, senor. You know, like, we, we, had, we had that moment. It was so funny, I was right next to him. And I'm the chair of Mecha. This, this, I helped make this thing happen. So I, I snapped to it, you know, like, Jose Montoya got, the ghost of Jose Montoya got to me, and I was like, because you don't got diversity in your department. We had all the statistics. Yeah, you know, thir 32 white men, you know, in your department. Where's the Chicanos? Where's your Chicano historian, huh? Where's your African-American historian? I got him good. That's called a, a cheap shot. What's it called? A, a blind, a, I blindsided him. But it was so funny because he, he hit Eddie Roy. And Eddie Roy was like, oh, way, like we got, but we snapped out of it and we realized, you know what? This is our university. And only, you know, Chicanx studies can do that. Only Mecha, only that Chicano tradition of Plato uh, could empower us like that to make us think, you know what, this is our university. 
oh man, he got so scared, I Eddie Roy'd him. And he went right back, he got back in and put the watch, you just heard all the, the change. <laughs> the desk, push the desk in front of the door. Oh, they ain't getting in here, boy. But it, we're bluffing. And they went to bed. Yeah. Any last questions, or should, should we throw the party? Get yeah, the tequila, the tequila bottles are under the seat. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>